We'll see how it goes at it. the Deputy Governor of the Bank of Zambia, Dr. Chpimo, and sitting at the far end is our Director for Human Resource, Mr. Tomba, and then I'm standing behind the Deputy Secretary of Cabinet, Mr. Masie, and the next to him is Mr. Mkuli Chikuwa. Honorable Minister, this is your show. In our meetings, we have the media from a very representative a sample, private media, public media, who would like to listen to you on your first day of appointment. If there are any comments, introductory comments to make by the ST, you may proceed and then call upon the Minister for Addresses. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. I think for me, it's uh, just my pleasure to introduce the uh, Minister of Finance, Dr. Um, Sogotwane. And uh, Honorable Minister, you may proceed to address uh, the gathering. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, SG, and uh, your colleagues from within the Minister of Finance, colleagues from ZRA, colleagues from Bank of Zambia, uh, members of the press. I shall be brief. Even the question to be brief, because as you can see, the atmosphere where we are in today is not conducive in this COVID uh, environment. We are making arrangements so that we can find a more conducive solution uh, in the future briefings. Having said that, I want to say that I'm extremely delighted to be back at the Minister of Finance. This is the first time that I'm becoming a member of the team of the Minister of Finance. First time was when I just graduated from the university in 1979. My first job ever was uh, here at the Minister of Finance. I came back later as an uh, advisor to Minister Kateri Kalumba during the PRSP days, if you remember, yes. Then I was back as Secretary to the Treasury. I was back as Minister of Finance, and I'm back again as Minister of Finance. So I'm not totally lost. There are a few changes that have taken place uh, physically and uh, uh, also in terms of ideas, but I have a very good understanding of this place because of the history that I've just indicated. I also want to thank uh, the President 
President Chichilema for showing confidence that he can come back to the Minister of Finance to lead his economic team. And all I can say is that I will not disappoint him and I will not disappoint the people of Zambia. We are here to do great things as an economic team under his administration. I'll come back to that point in a while. In the meantime, I want to say that uh, the ministry that I'm coming to is obviously uh, quite different from the one I left in 2011 in terms of the economic environment that we are experiencing as a country today. The economic environment meaning that the cost of living is escalated beyond what we had uh, imagined. Obviously, uh, the exchange rate where it is today or where it has reached, none of us ever dreamt that a dollar one day would cost even 20 quarter. Because those days, if it reached five or even six, there would be panic. Uh, but today, we, that is the situation. The dollar has become very expensive. But all this really, in summary, is that the people of Zambia are stressing economically. The people of Zambia are stressing. I must also add that uh, this stress, this economic stress, has its roots here in the Ministry of Finance. The stress arises from the fact that Zambia, over a relatively short period of time, has just borrowed too much money. Borrowed too much money, meaning that as we pay back this little liquidity for those running businesses to have customers, meaning that it has become hard for the government to hire essential workers such as teachers, health workers, or indeed even to provide uh, meaningful salary increments to the workers of the public service. So that's the difference that I come to, which was not there before. And it is this difference, it is this stress that has led the people of Zambia, more especially the youth, more especially the youth, to say to our colleagues, the one who were in charge before, please go and take a rest. Let's try a different team. Therefore, this administration, we are focusing, or we are going to focus a lot in economic issues. We don't care much about how your nose looks like. We don't care much about whether you are tall or short. We don't care much about what language you speak. That is not our politics. Our politics is what can we do to reduce and remove the stress that the people of Zambia are experiencing. How can we create jobs, jobs for the millions of youth who are roaming the streets, starting from those who have just ended in grade seven, grade nine, grade 12, university graduates, because unemployment is now right across the whole spectrum of society. So our focus will be how to generate, not how to generate, but to generate jobs for the young people through, number one, those where government is able to hire or should hire, like teachers and uh, health workers, within our means, we are going to put a lot of, we are going to put some steam into that. We know that there are about 50,000 trained teachers alone who are out there looking for jobs in the teaching service. And indeed, those jobs are necessary. Those of us running rural constituencies, we know that teachers are desperately needed. So we'll do something about that problem so that perhaps in the next five years, we can get back to normal, whereby essential workers 
such as teachers, health workers, are employed and put on payroll. That is the contribution of the uh, government. But there's a limit to which government can do to absorb the youth of the state. How many teachers can we employ? How many policemen can we employ? These are just thousands. But we know there are millions of young people looking for jobs. And those jobs must come from the private sector. So you see what we are going to do. We are going to do a lot to drive up the agenda in the private sector. We will push hard to make sure that our mining sector expands. The mining output has been stuck for the last 10 years with about 800,000 metric tons of copper per year. We are going to push aggressively so that mining output in the next 10 years comes to something like 3 million tons. By the end of the, this current mandate, we want to push mining output to something close to 2 million tons per annum from 800,000. Why? Because mining, as you know, is the one that gives foreign exchange, is the one that gives some employment, is the one that provides employment in many sectors that are related to mining, transport, banking, insurance, repairs, spares, construction, all those are related to mining. So we are going to push very hard for the mining sector. And the good thing is that the price of copper is projected to remain high for many, many years. It's going to be the new oil. In the 1970s, oil was the in thing. Now copper is the in thing because cars are no longer going to use petrol. They are moving towards uh, electrical uh, systems. So we are going to push the production of copper by creating a good environment for more investments to be done. And you'll be amazed how much foreign exchange this country is going to make with this price of copper. You will not, you will not know what to do with the dollars that this country will be receiving. Our problem may be just be the dollar becoming too cheap as we drive this process. We are going to make sure that there is value addition. <coughs> we are going to persuade credible investors to put investments into these more facility economic zones, which have been dormant in the last 10 years. So that in those emphases, we can draw copper wires. In those emphases, we can do copper alloys. You see like that lock there? The one that looks like gold? That's a copper alloy. It's copper mixed with something else, which currently is imported. Our job is to make sure that items like those, items like fridges, which are result of copper, items like starter motors, we are going to push to make sure that those populate the special or mount facility economic zones so that you, the young people, have a wider choice of jobs to get into. These juices that we import from South Africa, whether it is mango juice, whether it is orange juice, whether it's purple juice, we want to be the ones exporting those items into South Africa, into Europe, into the Americans. So there's going to be aggression to make sure that we produce these items in large quantities, value process within Zambia, and export. So this cotton, we will make sure that our farmers could get good incentives to grow cotton so that it is spun here. Out of that, we make cloth. Out of that, we are the ones to be exporting jeans, t-shirts, shirts, bed sheets, and so forth. So this is just a brief flavor of the agenda that we have to drive the economy to grow. 10 years ago, people were saying economic growth doesn't matter. 
Now you've seen for yourself what happens when there's no economic growth. You've seen for yourself when you have negative economic growth. Look at the poverty that is there. That is emerged. the earning power of the country is going backward, what it means is that on average, on average, each one of us will be poorer than before. That's why these economists will tell you that the per capita GDP or the average income per person, it has gone down. And that's not surprising because the growth of the economy is done what? It's starting a no snipe. So our challenge is to stop the economy declining put it in the opposite direction very aggressively. And I want to say, we are benchmarking, our, we are benchmarking ourselves very aggressively. Benchmarking means what we intend to be in the next 10, 15 years. We want to be like Mauritius. We want to be like Malaysia. We want to be like Thailand. So that the wheels of the economy grow. It's no longer about saying we uh, want economic growth, but really we want to transform. So this is what the uh, leadership president Akainde is bringing to the table, how to transform this economy beyond anything that we've ever seen before. It's a very aggressive, very aggressive. Now, to our, my colleagues here in the Minister of Finance, you've got a flavor of what we're aiming at. And we are the ones to facilitate that by making sure that money that is wasted in frivolous things is now invested into things that matter. When I talk about, for example, uh, when I talk about uh, producing three million tons of copper, there is a role for government, there is a role for private sector. Our role as government is to make sure that there is infrastructure going to where copper ores are discovered. You can't say there's copper there, but there's no road going there. There's no power going there. Yes, copper is there, but you will not be able to mine. When we're talking about tourism, it's no good to say we have animals, we have Victoria Falls, we have uh, this and that. These items are in the bush. How do you go into Lua, where I come from, and say, uh, want tourists, where are they going to sleep? Under the tree? Yes, they can sleep under the tree, but they live very little money. So the idea is to make sure that infrastructure, which is the responsibility of government, is to goes to where it can unlock investments. That's our duty at the Minister of Finance. Our duty is to make sure that we collect taxes so that we can train our people, train the young people, they are skilled, so that all these investments that we are talking about, the Zambians are not bystanders. The Zambians are participants because we can supply, we can work, to provide professional services. <coughs> so that is the agenda, Mr. ST. The money is going to be utilized carefully on things that assist the social sector, on things that generate more revenue for the country so that growth keeps on exploding. Wastage is to come to the end. As you see me here, I say that the 10 years when I was a private member of parliament representing a rural constituents, for me that was very good training. Very good training because I've seen, when we talk about shortage of teachers, I've seen it. Schools where I went, primary school where I went before going to secondary in uh, Hillcrest and Livingston. That primary school today is a basic school. But the number of teachers who are there are less than the number of teachers who were there when it was only up to grade seven. So that's why you heard the president talking about taking money to where it belongs. That is us here at the Minister of Finance, 
no useless seminars, no useless trips, because that money must be saved to go to where the rural people are suffering, things that I've seen with my own eyes in the last 10 years. Many of you have never slept in a swamp. I've slept in a swamp. Maybe one of these days, we should go and sleep in a swamp. <laughs> so that you see uh, what we are talking about. Um, issues of corruption. No one will protect you. If you are found in corruption, straight away to ACC. No one will protect you. So if there were schemes like that, say bye-bye to them. Issues of failing to deliver service. Come tomorrow, come tomorrow. License is taking seven years to produce. I've seen a situation like that. We are going to agree, ST. We'll call the private sector. What kind of services do we deliver here? ABC. We we'll agree that if an application for a particular license or something like that, if all the paperwork is correct, we have to commit ourselves that within X number of days, without question, this service must be delivered. If we don't deliver, the one who is supposed to deliver on that, we have to answer questions, serious questions, serious questions. Commissioner General, I believe you've already started some of those things, but we are going to push very hard to make sure that we provide service to the people of Zambia. Let me end here, because I've actually gone beyond what has intended. We'll take uh, a limited number of questions uh, so that we free you from this hazard here. <coughs> so let, let's be prudent with questions. There's a huge number of us here. Introduce yourself and the institution you're coming from. Get straight to the questions. We we'll start with the gentleman and the lady there. Uh, good morning, Honourable. Congratulations on your appointment. I am uh, Jimmy Kamasha from CBC Television. Um, there's been call, there have been calls from uh, various sectors uh, for the reappointment of a new bank governor, a central bank governor. I want to know what your take is on that. Uh, are you going to consider that, or what's your plan? That is beyond me. Uh, the bank governor is a presidential appointment. So if you get an opportunity, ask the president. I can't answer it. I'm sorry. Thank you so much. But thank you for the question. Thank you. We'll take the lady here and the other lady there. Thank you so much. I've got two burning questions. If I don't ask them, I'll collapse. So with your permission, please allow me to move. The first question is, about a year and uh, three months ago, government did engage um, an international financial advisor to help restructure the situation. And your government was in the forefront your of party. saying... Uh, your party. No, your government, your present government, uh, when that was announced, they actually condemned the acts to say we could have involved the local... And I, I understand that the, 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 the contract was for three years. So I wanted to find out how we're going to continue working with uh, Lazard in terms of restructuring the debt. Then my other question is, you've talked about the, the mining sector, where you said the issues of paper, but we know for a fact that the percentage that we caught in these mines is, 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 is very minimal. That's why we've not been having these resources. Are we going to see policies change that are going to compel these foreign investors to bank their resources back in Zambia? Because we know that the reason we are not benefiting is because these resources keep going out. So, uh, Thank you, madam. Okay, on the first one, on the first question, let me say that we don't come in office with a vindictiveness. So members of staff should not feel that uh, uh, we are here to profile people and say this one, no, this one, yes, and so forth. No. It all depends on merit. So similarly, on a question like that one, uh, we'll look at the situation. We said it. Uh, we said it without total information. We we'll look at the situation. If our fears then are confirmed, then of course that's a different route. But if we feel there might be some value, who knows? Uh, so we we'll look at the situation. Uh, we we'll make a recommendation to the president. Then we we'll agree on the way forward. 
On the mining sector, uh, first of all, yes, there's always a risk that you don't gain as much as possible. That is true. And we must examine, but you see, we must examine case by case. Don't just say the mining sector, we don't get anything. Break it down. Which mining company is doing its fair share? Which mining company is not doing its fair share? Don't just lump everything uh, uh, like that. Then you are at risk of making uh, mistakes. For those that we are not getting a fair share, there will be hard questions. Where is the problem? How can we resolve that? But indeed, the issue of driving up production is fundamental. Uh, somebody, I think the president would like saying, you cannot share poverty. And unless you increase poverty in the first instance by raising production, unless you do that, you're at risk of trying to extract something out of nothing. Our colleagues in Congo, 2011, they were producing less copper than us. Not so. Today, they're almost producing double the amount of copper that Zambia is producing. Congo DRC. That's why even the economic stress there in Congo DRC, you don't hear it as much as what it is in Zambia. What's the trick? Raising production. We'll get the question from writers and the, the lady there. Well, my name is Chris Infla from Reuters. Kindly speak up. Speak up, sir. My name is Chris Infla from Reuters. I just wanted to find out um, how you plan to address the question of Zambia's debt and uh, discussions with the IMF regarding the program. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Congratulations on your appointment, Honorable. My name is Esna Tlungu from Spring TV. Um, my first question is uh, related to uh, my colleague here. So there are concerns among stakeholders that you're finding yourself um, in a place where there's a, you, you find you'll be operating under a tight fiscal space, looking at the country's fiscal de deficit and the debt that we have. So how are you going to address us? What's your plan? What's your plan regarding having more um, financial resources to begin your economic operations? My second question is we've been informed that there's a debt restructuring team that the uh, president has appointed. Um, I don't know if you can disclose to us who is on that team. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. It is true. I don't have the numbers. Uh, because I was uh, outside, but generally speaking, everybody knows that the budget is under stress. It is under stress because unless we do something to the debt, unless we do something to the debt, then the budget is going to be a budget, mainly for paying salaries and also servicing debt. The numbers that we were seeing last year showed that out of uh, the quarter of revenue, before you introduce borrowing and things like that, out of every quarter of revenue, 19 way or 90 percent was going to pay salaries and service the debt, leaving only 10 in way. So unless we do something about the debt, this is going to be a budget for paying salaries and servicing the debt. Obviously, that is meaningless. So the answer is to talk to the people who owe money, creditors, so that we pay at a slower pace, stretched over a longer period of time, so that we unlock or we release cash for us to be able to do something more meaningful in the budget. The process towards that is that the ones you owe money, they will ask you a question. You want me to stretch the payment? Yes. But what guarantee do you give me that if I give you that kind of relief, you'll still be able to pay me? What's the guarantee? The guarantee is that you must have somebody who is the referee, who is the authenticator, and say, these chaps who are in office now, they are correcting the economic situation. 
They are building up to the growth of the economy. There will be more money coming to the country. Therefore, it makes sense to give them relief to pay over a longer period of time because they will be able to pay because the economy is changing. That authenticator is the IMF. That's why we've been hearing us talking so much about an IMF program. It is important that we get an IMF program so that we do the necessary reform, convince the creditors that we are serious, we'll be able to pay back, and of course, not just the creditors, for the good of the Zambian people who benefit from the release, the resources from the debt payment. So uh, I still have to get a full brief from the ST and the team at the uh, Bank of Zambia to tell me where we are with the program for the IMF. We are determined that maybe October, November, we should, if possible, even September, we should conclude the discussions because there have been discussions. We don't know where the hitches are. We'll learn now. September, October, we should conclude the issue of the program, go to the creditors, hear our books. This is what we are doing to clean up. So let's agree to stretch the payments so that the budget for next year has meaningful numbers. Beyond that, I think there are some things that are positive for us. The Commissioner General was briefing me that the revenue inflows have improved, obviously because of uh, higher copper prices, but also it tells me collection methods are better. We have also been told that the IMF, due to this COVID uh, problem, they are basically giving everybody, every member country, 1.1? Dollars. Dollars, yes. 1.3 billion dollars. 1.3 billion US dollars. And it has already come. It has already come. Okay, so we we'll have to examine the rules of the IMF and see how that money can be useful to us. So there are these positive elements that are uh, coming through. Uh, I think the World Bank, we had a discussion the other day also. They say there is some money that we can access quickly uh, to put in the budget for next year. So combination of debt rearrangement, the money from the IMF, the money from the World Bank, improved the revenue from uh, ZRI. I can almost guarantee that the stress on you, the citizens of Zambia, will definitely be less next year. And uh, the exchange rate should move. The exchange rate should move, given all these uh, factors. It should also move because there are some people who did not trust the management of the uh, previous government's economy. They thought that as long as they left their money here, there was a risk that one day things could blow up, one day they would be returned to exchange controls to conserve the little reserves that were there. So quickly, they took out their dollars, packed them in all sorts of places. But now, when the confidences are coming, and them also knowing that the exchange rate is definitely going to appreciate. That's why partly we see a flurry of people bringing back dollars before they lose out. Because some have already lost out. And they brought their dollars when the exchange rate was 22. For every dollar, they would have 22 quite. Now, for every dollar, they can only get 60. I don't know what the exchange rate is today. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure many. All I can tell to them is that you have nothing to fear. This is a government that is going to be friendly to enterprise and business. If you delay bring your dollars in the country, that is up to you. You may end up receiving only nine quarter to a dollar or something like that. Who knows? I can never predict. So uh, this is where we are. And I think the people of Zambia require relief. There have been other stress for far too long. If you go in these markets, look at where the prices are. Because we import. Uh, my second question was on the debt restructuring. Oh, no, I have no information on that. So. <laughs>
Thank you very much, Honorable Minister. I think uh, let's welcome the Minister to the Ministry with a round of applause. The staff and yourselves, come. Uh, I'm sure there will be more engagements. Let allow the Minister to proceed to his next assignment. Let's digest what he has shared with us. And uh, in the process of budget preparation, we may have an engagement or two with the public or interest groups. Therefore, you can come there and ask your questions. Unless you have some concluding remarks to your briefing, Honorable Minister. Well, I thank you a lot, colleagues. We shall definitely be engaging you so that you know where we are at every stage. But remember, our focus is to make all of you to enjoy your citizenship of this country through so better living standards. That's our focus. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Thank you.